Okay, hello everyone. Today our guest is uh, one of uh, classics of the theory and practice of audiovisual translation, Jorge Diaz Sinas. I'd like Jorge to say a few words about his current position uh, because there were some changes at the university where he used to study, so I give the floor to him and then we'll proceed to the question that our viewers and listeners of our course uh, sent over to me. Uh, um, good morning, Alexei, and many thanks for the interview here in St. Petersburg. It's a pleasure to be here with you and being interviewed. Uh, as you said, yes, my name is Jorge de Arcintas. I come originally from Spain, but I've been living in Britain for a long time. And uh, since 2013, I've been working at the university, University College London, uh, where I became the director of the Center for Translation Studies, called Centras, where we teach audiovisual translation as one of our many other areas of specialization in translation. And, and I am currently a professor in translation studies. Oh, uh, I know that you penned uh, several groundbreaking books on the theory of audiovisual translation. When it really came to your attention? Uh, well, I was lucky enough, I went to Britain uh, many years ago uh, and I just happened to be at the right time, uh, in the right place at the right time. Um, I arrived in 89 and uh, I started working as a translator and it was only a few years later when digitization came to be that some of the companies were starting to move into audiovisual translation and there were lots of archival films that had been originally only dubbed into Spanish and then with the distribution on DVD they needed lots of translators to translate films into uh, subtitles and um, one of the companies just approached me and said well you know you've done some translations for us would you like to do some subtitling as well for us uh, I was a little bit uh, worried at the beginning because I didn't have any training in the area but they told me well nobody else has got the training it's, it's something so new uh, that you know we were quite happy to just train you uh, in, in this place and, and then you can start working with us and that's the way I started working in the field so it was just lack that you know, digitization came to be uh, at that point in time and also that I was precisely in London where most of the large corporations had offices and they were in, in urgent need of people with languages. Uh, when was it? Uh, I started working in the field in the early 90s, 92, 93 I started doing Do you translation. Mean that before that audiovisual translation hadn't been institutionalized? No, no, that's not what I mean, of course not. Uh, audiovisual translation had been in operation since cinema virtually started. So we needed translations to do the translation of the intertitles and then we started, you know, once the talkies were invented, we needed to cross borders uh, with those films. So, you know, attempts were made with multi multilingual versions, with dubbing, with subtitling and so on. But in my particular case, I, I, I wasn't trained as an audiovisual translator in, in Spain. I was trained in philology, which was the area that we were most of us doing in languages, and, and I was doing translations, but written translations of text. And I started in, in that area in the early 90s, uh, when these companies were asking for people to do subtitling. But of course the area exists is much earlier than all that. Uh, but when I was in Spain, I was too young to, to be working in the field and I never really worked there. So your practical experience uh, helped you a lot to make this transition from a practitioner to a scientist? Uh, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, I was already working in my uh, MA dissertation and I had already started working in my uh, PhD. Um, and at the time I was working on uh, blendings and functional linguistics uh, in English and then how shortenings were very prevalent in the language, which was an area that I sort of liked but it wasn't really quite fulfilling. And it was when I started doing the subtitling that I felt well maybe there would be an area that I could tap in to, to do my research, my uh, postgraduate research. Um, and it was a rather bold decision because I was doing my PhD in a university where everybody else was working for their PhDs on Shakespeare or functional grammar. <laughs> uh, but I decided I came with something that it was nobody was doing and, and, and I had a very uh, generous and understanding PhD supervisor and then she allowed so me to... So you abandoned Shakespeare in favor of audiovisual? Uh, I did at the very beginning but I did half my little compromise and one of my first articles is actually on subtitling Shakespeare oh. <laughs> into Spanish. So it took me a while but it was progressive but I started on, on that sort of area. 
Oh, I see. Uh, may I ask you a personal question? Uh, uh, as a, me, as a, as an audiovisual translation, I love more doing subtitles, subtitling uh -huh. translation. Uh, some people love more translation for dubbing. Okay, yeah. uh, which breed are you? Uh, I think um, I probably sit in between. I think I prefer slightly more uh, subtitling uh, because I've done it a little bit more because I've been teaching a lot more about that and I've done more research on that. But the little bit that I've done on dubbing, I have to admit that it's very uh, enriching as well. You can play a lot more with language. Uh, you can twist things in another way that you think it might sound or it might not sound good. Uh, whereas subtitling, you've got your two lines at the bottom of the screen and, and somehow you play with your reduction, with your condensation. But at least in my language, it's very difficult to be too creative with the language, the same way that you would probably do when you're talking. Because our grammar is very strict, it's regulated by our academy of the language and, and you cannot distort language as you might be able to do when you are talking and using dubbing. Um, so that's why I, I think it allows you all that creativity. Uh, when you are doing your dubbing, you can reflect accents, you can reflect uh, wrong endings in, 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 in your expressions. But as when you are doing your subtitles, it becomes much more formal in, in Spanish on, on, on the two lines. So it somehow limits slightly your way of maneuvering with the text. But how do, still how, prefer subtitling. How do you find the limits of this formality? How, form, how really formal? Uh, is subtitling in terms of the requirements for a linguist? How uh, tight is this uh, rope yeah. which ties your hands? It can be very tight on some occasions. Um, we, of course, every language has got a way of speaking where we manipulate language in a different way. We repeat ourselves, we're probably much freer with swearing and uh, blasphemies. Uh, particularly in my language, we drop some endings in certain words uh, when we are talking, but not when we are writing. And that, in effect, and immediately has an impact on the degree of colloquialism and informality in your language. So when you are writing in Spanish, you, you really need to go back to what the academy of the language is saying and even though you might have said something with a different ending, with a different way of expressing it, you will then reduce it to the standard way. The only area that you can play a little bit more will be with uh, Lexis. So you might find synonyms that might be more colloquial or less colloquial, but we hardly ever play with syntax or with morphology in Britain. Uh, unless it's for a very, very specific case, uh, when you might think, well, without playing with the language in written text, then the whole point is going to be missed. Uh, and then I need to make it convey, I, I, I need to convey that information there. And we've got a few films that are iconic in our language, for instance, um, you know, The Life of Brian, and there is this um, uh, uh, Roman uh, guy that speaks with, uh, 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 with a lisp in his speaking uh, and then you know without that sort of lisping leading to misunderstandings in the language then there is no you know you cannot understand what is going on that's when the Spanish get distorted uh, and it makes it really difficult to follow at the beginning because you're not that's not what you're expecting uh, but eventually you swing into the the changes there and then you can follow but that is a very unique case you know usually when everybody's speaking with that sort of um, phonetic or linguistic uh, variation you will neutralize it on your subtitles and it will appear as a neutral thing do you share the concept of pseudo reality which uh, or the third norm as pevesi uh, promotes it for Italian terms, uh, yeah. uh, idea of uh, pseudo-orality. Is it a valid notion uh, if applied to subtitling? And is it different in various language prayers? Well, that were three questions in one. <laughs> but I do agree. I do agree that there is a pseudo language or a third language and it, it was already has been already hypothesized in other areas of translation with Gideon Turi and the scripted translation studies but there is a language in between the original and the tagged language which is the language of the translation and then you do things uh, that you probably do, don't do in the original or in the other language and then we come with these universals of translation uh, that they just happen in translation uh, sometimes. I do agree and there is, there is uh, research done by colleagues 
in, in many languages, particularly in Italian, but they've been working a lot on uh, um, Dabis, as, as it's called, and, and also people in Spain. And you do find uh, things, uh, strategies that you systematically apply, or at least more frequently, in, in, in translation that you do in the original. But particularly, it tends to happen in the use of certain words, or in the way that you convey certain expressions, uh, but not so much in the syntax, for instance, or the morphology. Uh, and that's what has been found in many of the research that has been done. It's most the lexis that tends to repeat itself. There are more calques from the English. In Russian, grammar and syntax are much more flexible because we have the free word order yeah. and it's absolutely different. Yeah, not, not in other languages, uh, like for instance Spanish, but it's very fixed uh, grammatically and straight away mistakes will be pointed out if you don't follow certain uh, grammar rules. Um, the Brits could be much more, uh, you know, the English can be, English language can be also much flexible in, in many areas, you know, just by using apostrophes you will get the impression that they are very colloquial when they are speaking um, or using acronyms as soon as possible ASAP, you know, and then that will give you the impression that you've been very colloquial when you are reading and speaking uh, but that's much more complicated in, in languages, particularly Latin based languages like Spanish or French, I know as well, they, they tend to be much more standard. But coming back to your questions, I do agree that there is this element of um, hybridity in the translation and particularly in dubbing uh, where more research has been done. I'm pretty sure that there is also some element uh, of that certainty in translation happening in subtitling. The problem is that we haven't done that much research in the uh, sub subtitles uh, to make to coin a new term as they do in dubbies. Um, that's been done less frequently and I think my feeling is that there is this sort of nagging um, idea that maybe it doesn't happen as often as in dubbing uh, and that's why there is not much to be found when you're looking at subtitling because you will usually listen to the original, you restructure your text in whichever is the end language and you just detach yourself a lot more from the original. But as in dubbing, because of the lip sync and so on, you tend to be a bit, a bit closer to the original and, and that's why then you start getting all these terms, which is the uh, dubbies, as they call it, that you pro probably wouldn't use normally speaking in Italian, but it makes sense to just fit it in the mouth and in the lips of these people on the screen. I have two more interesting questions. Uh, when I first read the Netflix style guide, it is actually hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, that should have been written by scientists, but it was written by practitioners. Uh, and it, they tried to establish norms for the evaluation of the quality of subtitle. Why it happened that we, all of us, I mean the scientific community, uh, well for our company it's a little bit more different because we are both a pr practicing company and a research company. But uh, is there any system of good evaluation of subtitles? And why the practitioners had to actually do the job of uh, scientists? What do you think the reason for that was? Uh, well, I can only make a hypothesis. You know, I wasn't involved in, in this period. And we all know that Netflix has come to be, it came to be not that long ago. So they've been in the industry for not a long time, although it seems that they've been there forever. And, and the changes that they are instigating are, are really very pervasive and, and, and many companies are taking yes, exactly. uh, are, are taking notice of what they are doing. Um, my hypothesis or, or, or the way that I, I say it is that they were they found themselves probably in a tight spot, that they had lots of material to be translated, uh, to be subtitled in, in, in many languages. Uh, they knew that they were going progressively uh, moving into different markets and different areas with different languages as well. And, and they need it to be quick and act, um, you know, pretty uh, on the spot. And I guess that that was what probably one of the primary and overriding decisions, that they needed to have material that they could use straight away and, and do their translations. And probably one area to do that is, okay, let's see what the practitioners are doing in, in other companies, how translation is being done there and, and, and on the screens by many of the multinationals that are already working in subtitling. Maybe we can get inspiration what is being done there and maybe we can come up with our own guidelines on how to do subtitles. 
having said that and, and looking at their information because again another area that they've changed and I've been working in this field for many years uh, this sort of material tends to be pretty secretive on, on occasions companies would be a little bit hesitant to give you the information to do research for instance um, now what we find is the opposite uh, poll uh, in this uh, situation. Netflix, the first thing they did was to put all their guidelines on the internet and then you can go, anybody can go and can get their guidelines, which is a very clever um, step forward because it's obviously by, is a de facto um, approach to make everybody use their guidelines. And I know now that many universities teaching subtitling, they will go to the guidelines of Netflix simply because they're easy and they are available on the internet and that's the way they're teaching you, their students that then when they become subtitles will be more than used to the guidelines proposed by, by Netflix. So that was one, one, one way, a very clever way of making their guidelines as pervasive as they are these days. Uh, but you can see if you go through the guidelines that they're pretty dynamic in that sense and you get different versions. So they've got, you know, they keep them sort of up to date with several changes according to the information and the bit feedback that they get from people. I do agree. Russian, we have already four editions of uh, yeah. uh, uh, they do in many languages. Uh, you know, I, I, I was recently in India and we were looking at the guidelines and there are things there that they don't really, people, Indian people didn't feel reflected in that sort of, in those sort of guidelines. And we were going to, we, we're going to be sending information to Netflix, say, okay, fine, you know, you propose this, but actually in reality that doesn't really happen, happen in the country, so you might want to consider things or you might want to continue with this, uh, with these guidelines. But I think in that sense they're very, uh, quick to react and they're very willing to receive feedback and you know see whether they can do things there and, and change. So I think I, I see their guidelines as a work in progress, that they probably in a few years time they will be slightly different or they will have been readapted. I would have of course welcomed um, some more um, interaction with scientists or with people working in academia uh, to see how you know, we can try and reach some sort of agreement on, on, on areas that we might think is better for quality or is not for quality. Or might whatever. a conference or a round table or a workshop, a two-day workshop uh, on the Netflix standards for subtitling be a good idea? I think it would be an excellent idea. And, um, and I know, for instance, that Netflix are very willing to establish links and collaboration with academics and with other stakeholders. We will in the be willing to participate with the input on Russian and uh, Ukrainian and we are doing Kazakh stuff because we are not pleased with what they suggest for Russian because it's uh, mostly based on the Russian school of academic written translation in Russia, audiovisual translation is still classified as written yeah. translation. It doesn't directly. make much sense. The, 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 some sense. But yeah, some sense, but some, we some. know that you know, subtitles are different to written. And here my next question goes. Uh, you know the advent of uh, new technologies, uh, 3D, that's what I uh, uh, came to the community with in 2011, but now we are talking about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, uh, metadata. Uh, metadata is actually subtitles 2.0 because metadata appears uh, upon your uh, will when you look at augmented reality. Uh, do you think we need another overview of uh, the science of uh, audiovisual translation? Do you, do you think we are on the verge of uh, the next serious scientific revolution? I mean, in, in our industry only. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you asked me that because, you know, I, as you know, I am involved in the organization of several conferences, one of them being the one in Berlin that takes every time, uh, takes place every two years and this October is going to be uh, the next one and the title is The Fourth Revolution uh, and uh, The Fourth Industrial Revolution and the impact that is having in audiovisual translation. So there is a topic uh, and an area that is being attracting and, uh, you know, getting the interest of many stakeholders, not just translators, not just producers, but also 
partners in the industry, for instance, in metadata. Uh, it was just last Thursday in, in, in Britain that there was um, a gathering of uh, professionals in the industry and metadata was one of the main topics being discussed in there uh, in relation to um, search engine optimization, but also in a virtual reality, immersive settings uh, and so on and so forth. So I do think uh, that the time is pretty uh, ripe now to just move beyond the uh, crunch of audiovisual translation, which is of course moving from one language to another, but then look as well at the possibility that that transition has beyond the mere linguistic uh, bridging and, and the potential that it opens to create new products and new programs that are going to be based on the metadata, for instance, new experiences, if you are doing uh, immersive technologies and playing your video games, that's going to be a completely different experience as the one you probably going through these days um, and, and that is an area that we need to monitor very closely that we need to also try to embed in our teaching of audiovisual translation and make students and other uh, people aware of that extra potential that goes beyond the translation in itself but also the impact that it has in technology itself and how technology is impacting on our way of doing translation. Well, well I think that we shouldn't repeat the example, the poor example of uh, fun subbing which stepped in when uh, uh, there was the influx of VOD content and not enough subtitlers. Here the industry should be prepared because poorly done uh, virtual reality subtitles are dangerous for health, yeah, actually. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I've read some of your articles uh, and what sometimes, you know, the, uh, the impact is physical, you know, that you can, your body can react negatively to, to, to that. VR is very physical because we are doing the measurements right now how people uh, react to sensory pressure because uh, we are testing it right now and a poorly done translation which increases the overload on your brain by 25 percent may actually result in a nervous breakdown because it's so immersive you already are wearing a helmet you already subject your brain to yeah, yeah. Enormous lots of impact and lots of you know, a lot of impact yeah. and for example a, a spanish production is well balanced mm -hmm. You move on to the German one. Yeah, and, and it's totally different. It goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I, I fully agree. And I think that is, uh, um, you know, is, is, is a very promising area for research uh, and is a very exciting uh, period for, for all of us involved in this field uh, because it's the beginning, it's the pioneering stages. And, and I do hope that is going to be a lot more, uh, there, there are going to be more synergies with people like you, people like me in academia, in the industry, people crossing across the two areas. Uh, it is really truly needed and it, this is an area that I've always felt it was missing. Uh, it is missing in many fields, in, in many disciplines within translation, um, literary translation and editors, they, they don't seem to see eye to eye sometimes, uh, in scientific translation as well, but I think in, in audio visual translation for all these years that I've been involved in, in, in the field seems to be you know the, the, the gatherings that we organize the, this interview that we're having right now that breaches those sort of gaps that it, uh, is trying all the time to bring academics professionals and even manufacturers um, um, developers and so on together and I think uh, that's what we need to keep up going and, and trying to establish, you know, uh, to, to do projects or to do conferences or gatherings where all these people keep meeting and discussing how we can progress, how can we can do things that are going to be better for the translation, for the developers, for the distributors, for the producers and so on. Difficult, but I think it can be done. You see, the uh, thing is that uh, I have, you know, do you think that all this techno, techno hype about machine translation will affect us doing subtitle translation a lot? Or what, what is actually your perception of all this? Well, I call it hype because I have my own perception of that. But what do you think? Maybe I'm not right. <laughs> uh, I, I do agree with you, there is a hype. And, and, and there, there is no there is no doubt about it. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the conference that I was attending in, in London, the event, and there was metadata was 
possibly one of the strongest topics that have been discussed, but also artificial intelligence and um, uh, in subtitling and audiovisual translation. And there was no, uh, you know, there were quite a few people discussing the topic and I don't think anybody left that building knowing what actually artificial intelligence is. And, and there were people asking, you know, and their understanding was slightly different. Some people were using artificial intelligence sort of as a similar or a synonym to uh, machine translation, which is not quite. Uh, some of the people were uh, relating it to the possibility of machines learning from mistakes and so on, which wasn't quite what other people were understanding. And then we had really clear, distinct uh, people from the industry. So there were the, the ones from the technological side driving this push on, on how important this could be for the industry. But then there were the producers and distributors that didn't quite see the the point of how he was doing and I remember a lady uh, very sort of starkly saying well I, I do agree on all this that probably in the future that will be uh, something to look forward to but in my company the way we're doing things now I feel that I am pretty much a traditionalist because we still continue with the same sort of way that we've done it before and I still don't see how that's gonna help my life uh, in the first instance so I think it's, it's just Sorry to, to, to stop you there, but I think it's just uh, very important. What I think is interesting here is this sort of push of the potential of what we can do, but also the, 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 the challenge that there are some practices there, that there are some people uh, working in there that they still don't manage to see that, and that probably the, 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 the interaction between the two need to be in much better condition, in a much more uh, synchronous uh, approach to see new developments happen uh, and I don't think it's going to be happening anytime soon you know we're going to be moving probably in that direction of technology but I think real effect in professional practice is going to take a bit longer than probably some people expect. Uh, you see uh, for me artificial intelligence uh, in our business as a practitioner I could say that uh, artificial intelligence is a kind of an expert system uh, allowing us to uh, actually compile glossaries and uh, key name and phrases and when you are doing uh, for example a transmedia project like uh, Winks of 250 series episodes or something else well it is uh, irreplaceable because you cannot remember what was done 10 seasons ago uh, we know of some very costly mistakes uh, but it's not machine translation because it's uh, uh, and a lot of people don't understand that. Um, I think uh, we should explore. Do you think we should explore more this issue and drive it home to more people that uh, sh it, it, there should be some subdivision uh, between artificial intelligence and machine translation? Otherwise, we'll be stomped, stampeded by yeah. uh, machine translators. Uh, yeah, as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's very challenging because nobody has sort of sat down to spell out what is actually uh, that we understand by artificial intelligence in our particular field. And our particular field is by nature quite complex. So a lot of people were talking, for instance, now one of the big drives is dubbing and dubbing in the cloud and then speech recognition and um, all these areas or uh, voice synthesis is also was part and parcel of this artificial intelligence, how the machines can learn from uh, the speech of someone, recreate certain intonations and so on. So it really dilutes itself as a concept in, in many directions. Now machine translation or even uh, memory tools uh, have been in the translation field for many years in, you know, in scientific, technical, medical translation. They've been you know, appearing all the time. Uh, we've got uh, you know, very solid uh, uh, software and, and programs like uh, Trados that has been going on for many years now is still not quite uh, in synchrony with subtitling for instance so uh, there are a few experiments some uh, you know people are seeing whether there is any potential of these uh, programs to actually be resourceful and be fruitful in subtitling for instance but there isn't that sort of appetite from the other side of the coin you know it's, it's a lot more academics in audiovisual translation but not so much the developers in, in, in those sort of fields. Um, and that's why I think we find ourselves struggling for terminology that we still don't see what it is there and struggling as well what is it that we actually need. I do think that you know working with glossaries as you mentioned earlier on and for the 
consistency of products that ran for many episodes, that ran for years, and it will be very difficult to keep uh, a human being remembering all these things, and never mind one human person. You Educational humanity. and religious texts, uh, films are also... Exactly. Like, I know that uh, the, I was invited to teach a course at the Church of uh, the Last Day Saints, and they once told me that they have about 10,000 of uh, video episodes which have to be systematized and dubbed and subtitled. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, the, 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 the point there is that the idea of one subtitler dealing with the whole program is long gone. You know, and what you do get now is many subtitlers probably working with, an, with several episodes of a film, oh. of a series or something. So you need to get them also to be working to a common target, that there are certain expressions, that it, it, it doesn't matter what it happens, all subtitles should be using the same translation. And they have to be taught that exactly. common target. Exactly, exactly. But I, I think, you know, again, you know, the practice was that you will get your film and you will translate it as a single subtitler. And it was rare to have a team of subtitlers. Having a team of translators in, in, in video games has been the name of the game for many years now. And I think, in my opinion, we're moving sometimes in the direction of video games as well. Video games have been a lot more in the production, post-production and in between sometimes and localization being thought through before the actual video game is produced and changing images if they need to change and so on. Subtitling we've always been an afterthought. It's always post-production. You finish your film, it's done, now let's translate. What is more productive for crossing the cross-cultural barrier? The game approach to subtitling and uh, audiovisual translation or our classical approach? Because uh, they usually do the international releases. I mean the gamers, yeah, yeah. they live by international releases. Ah, yeah, we shape. usually release into a single market. It's very rare when people think in advance, ah, I'm making the Marvel movie and what is what money is it going to make in the Indian market, which is the second largest in the world, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which is more productive because it's actually the drive that is going on. Yeah. I don't think there is a black and white answer there uh, because it will depend ultimately on the production that you're doing. You might know that your Spanish film or your Russian film is going to be low budget, your distribution channels are going to be a bit curtailed and then possibly doesn't really make much sense to give it too much thought at the beginning. Uh, but if you are a large company like Netflix, you do know that your programs are going to be seen throughout the world and, and that you know localizing or having an idea of what localization will look like afterwards it needs to be part of your process at the very beginning and that's why we've seen for instance very novel changes in the industry the same ship distribution of films of uh, video games sorry where they know is going to be launched straight away to the rest of the world that's been already been simulated uh, for instance by Netflix but social networks uh, now are giving to anyone to you me for example we could turn on YouTube and live of broadcast course. Into, and uh, we could easily yeah, yeah. create a channel of about 200,000 viewers using Facebook Watch technology which was recently announced. But so isn't it the same SIM ship? Simulcast that they call as well in the broadcasting industry. Yeah, it is. We're moving in that direction. And, and, and some people do know that that is happening. You know, there was somebody talking from the BBC about Doctor Who and they know Doctor Who is going to be translated in all these languages and they are terrified about piracy and so on. And they're changing the working uh, flows to make sure that programs are not going to be out there before the actual distributors want them to be out there, but also they're not going to be pirated from by fan subbers, that they're going to come with their translations, their subtitles and so on. And that's what we find sometimes uh, on occasions, people, the uh, turnover of their translation in like something like 24 hours, you've got some programs by Netflix done straight away, the following day you've got subtitles in about 20 something languages. So this is happening and, and some people are looking at that possibility that you know, you have to be thinking about your localization much earlier than in the post-production. Um, you need to just work with teams of people that are going to be able to manage a translation of a program in a fraction of the time that one subtitler will take. And, and those are working flows that are very novel. Some companies are still a bit hesitant because they've never done it and they find it's a bit stressful. But I fear that's going to be the, the, the sort of look of the future, that you will have to be much more 
are much quicker to come up with your translations if you don't get the competition or the illegal uh, distribution of your programs with the translations done by whoever. Will this approach be given more insight and more attention at the conference in Berlin? Because it's actually, from what you are saying, it's actually a part of the fourth technological revolution. It should be given because if we can discuss it for quite a lot, but uh, there should be some producers uh, also attending people who are involved in Russia. For example, we interact closely with uh, the association of uh, TV and movie producers because they understand in Russia exporting movies is becoming rapidly becoming a pretty uh, big industry. Uh -huh. But they understand the recent Russian hits at Netflix, Masha and the Bear, uh, several other hits. Uh, they were they involved translation from the very creation of the script. Of course. Well, they're here because uh, it, it helped save money. Yeah. Are mistakes in subtitle translation costly by your experience? Uh, they can be very, very costly. How costly? Could you, could you at least uh. give a couple of examples <laughs> with Spanish or whatever other language you know? Well, how costly? Tens of thousands of dollars? Millions of dollars? Uh, no, I wouldn't probably go that high. And uh, on occasions, it's more reputational costs uh, that some, you know, with social networks be, being very dynamic and, and raising the visibility of certain of, uh, mistakes and so on. It might be that, you know, people end up with egg in their faces, certain companies. We have had uh, occasions on Spanish TV when the film is finished and then you get the credit of the fan subber who did it with a sort of uh, silly name. Uh, so then they've been left letters to the TV station, uh, the TV station be mentioned on the newspapers and the really negative uh, publicity and so on. So then they apologize and they come with, you know, sorry, we will change and we won't do that again and blah, blah, blah. We didn't realize that it was that way or it was done by somebody else. Um, that's, they don't really go back and change the translation and produce a better translation or pay anybody or pay a penalty for, for that mistake. So I don't think it goes in along those lines, uh, but it's more that raises awareness that it gives them the negative uh, publicity that they didn't really want and, and that is making them think twice about how that is, is being done. Um, but I, I do feel that, you know, you mentioned we were talking earlier on about these conferences in, in, in China now, which are pretty similar as well to what you were mentioning now about Russia, that even the government in certain countries is realizing that they need to reach out, that they need to go out with their programs and they need to be translated. There is no other way that we're, not, we're going to consume, we're going to consume uh, Chinese programs around the world or uh, Russian programs. And now they're organizing, and I think that's what is very exciting to me to hear and to see, is that they are organizing these workshops or these events packed to the Beijing Film Festival or the Shanghai Film Festival at the same time, so that producer, uh, producers are uh, aware of these changes of these possibilities that are out there uh, is, is sometimes very depressing to be talking to film directors about their films being translated and they don't even realize that they were translated, that there were mistakes, that they t took some strategies that they, when you tell them, they're totally against that sort of approach, but they didn't even they weren't even aware of those. And I know really famous sub uh, film directors in Britain, films translated into Spanish, which is a large language in the world. And when you mention to them, okay, did you realize that your Polish character is being done in this way in the translation, but it doesn't make much sense. When you see the subtitles, oh, I didn't realize. Uh, that's really bad. How could they do that? Well, it's your film after all, you know, but why didn't you take care of that? But that's sometimes a bit sort of, you know, it, it shows to us that there is a lot more work to do, not just among ourselves, translators, but also reaching out to other stakeholders and other people in the industry. Don't you think we researchers and uh, people who are on the border of being practitioners and researchers should be more consolidated in our approach to producers because they should be aware of uh, certain centers where they could uh, get some expertise because uh, they know where to get the good uh, film directors, they know where the cast casting agencies, but they don't know any uh, agencies which could uh, actually evaluate yeah. the potential of a script. Uh, I know how the scripts and movies are sold, that they first are brought to come as, a, as two yeah. sheets of paper yeah. and that's where the 
difference between the name and the content goes because people buy at bottom rock price two sheets of paper and afterwards discover listen it was not supposed to be a uh -huh. movie about insects eating people yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or something whatever it is <laughs> on that occasion no i do think that you know uh, and some people have been uh, proposing certain context concepts like you know localization experts uh, that that will be the the, the role uh, in the industry will be to analyze the potential of certain programs and productions uh, to reach other cultures and, uh, and, and you know, to cross borders linguistically and not only linguistically uh, but also for instance in the sense of uh, making them available for people with sensory disabilities. Um, so colleagues of mine like Pablo Romero Fresco has been uh, proposing for many years now that they should be filmmaking, accessible filmmaking, so that you know from the very beginning, from the inception of the idea of what, what is it that you want to do. You see, for, you for them accessible program. filmmaking is accessible for people with disabilities. Yeah. Now we are talking about uh, filmmaking acceptable for people, uh, uh, accessible for people from other cultures. Because, for example, the Chinese movies have, they are great. They are amazing. Mm -hmm. Russian movies are amazing. But uh, certain cultural realities are and not difficult to be understood or are improperly rendered in translation because it's like. Uh, especially with the Chinese movies, because they have the so-called glass wall between uh, certain cultural notions and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian movies, because uh, people tend more to see not the plot, yeah, they but pay attention to all the, the things, cultural yeah. reality. So this is uh, where we I think, yeah. should step in. Don't you agree? Yeah, I, I fully agree. But I was saying that's why I gave this sort of this other example about accessibility, which of course it is to make to make sure that these films are going to be accessible to people with disabilities or with sensory disabilities. But you could equally do you could equally train people that are going to be uh, giving advice on how to make those products or what the risks will be in certain productions to make the programs travel globally into other cultures. And that will be a sort of localization, localization mediator or localization expert that, that can straight away pinpoint areas that you know if you're going to be shooting this way or if you're going to be going make if you're going to be doing references making references to a particular concept or area that might be challenging for other people how important it is for you, the plot of your film or maybe you can come up with another idea or another option that will make your film travel much easier and I think that that shouldn't be a problem it's been tested and done frequently in the video game industry to make sure that the, the videos the video games are going to be going to have a, a global appeal and and I know you know the 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 Hollywood industry is pretty clever as well to reach the world and I'm pretty sure that they've got people with that sort of expertise that are going to know you know the things that might be challenging to cross borders and some others that might be easier to reach other countries you know and there's no surprise that centers like Los Angeles is going to be really multicultural a melting pot of different cultures with people working in the industry from different languages and and, and parts of the world that will probably have an impact as well on how it's done. Other industries are much more uh, self-centered with probably less um, you know people involved from other cultures and other languages and probably as well less visibility or thinking that you know they don't have the potential of going around the world um, now what we're seeing is and uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, examples earlier on on, on how the big platforms like Netflix are also using programs in other languages, not just English. And it was only a year ago that Netflix, well, there was an article about the, the, the long-term future of Netflix. And Netflix Almost said, every day I'm reading about them signing Latin American programs for Netflix, Indians, Russians. Exactly. Uh, Netflix is the uh, kind of outsourcing, it's cheaper. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an actual process, uh, the actors uh, are cheaper, everything is cheaper, and it makes a bigger profit margin. So yeah. this is the drift which is going to and they are and they are I think as always there is this globalization uh, for there are these globalization forces but at the same you at the same time you've got the localization forces when you want to see something more local and I think that's what they are now uh, tapping into you've got these global products that are going to reach all the world but then you've got also the local 
uh, forces and I don't know maybe Russian might not be very popular in Netflix in Latin America but it might be very popular in ex-Soviet Union republics and, and, people, Latin, Amer and Latin America because I know Latin that uh, I know there's statistics from uh, the Russian companies who sold their stuff to Netflix Latin Americans are well due to the image of uh, Russia in, the, in Latin America they are very popular in yeah. India in China yeah. You might get as well Japanese programs that might not be very popular in Europe, we never use, but they are extremely popular in Korea or in Vietnam or in Thailand. In Philippines or, or the Philippines. And the population is among us in those countries as well. So again, you might not want to localize everything into all the languages or expecting the same sort of revenue in all the languages, but you are creating niches in different uh, air parts of the world that are going to be equally productive equally uh, interesting from a financial perspective and opening up all these languages. And this is what is happening now. There are many programs now, Netflix originals, which are done in Spanish or in Russian or in French or in Swedish or in other languages. And the challenge there for us in the academia, for instance, is how do you uh, react to the variety of languages? Are we going to be able to translate Turkish into Spanish directly? Or are we going to go, are we going to have to go via English most likely, then translate into the other languages, and what are they going to be the linguistic flows of all? Well, oh, here it is. Uh, here it is uh, an even an even more burning problem because uh, the former Soviet Union uh, shares the same language pool because the educated class of almost all foreign so former Soviet Union countries spoke and is mostly still speaking Russian uh -huh. uh, because uh, the books on a lot of subjects are still written in Russian uh, it's, it's English or Russian lingua franca uh, or for example uh, Georgian may speak to uh, Lithuanian way very easily switch yeah. into Russian so it's a kind of lingua franca two more two last questions the first one self-censorship uh, you see the issue of self-censorship uh, should audiovisual translators dealing with various issues be aware of something to be censored? I mean, culturally, swear words, some cultural notions, etc., uh, etc. Et and the last question, which subtitling platform uh, software will you recommend to the beginners and the professionals? What is your point of view? These are the two last questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'll start first mm -hmm. uh, with the first one, which is one that is pretty close to my heart. I've been writing lately about censorship, manipulation, and, and how we deal with translation in, in the audiovisual. Especially industry. in subtitles, because subtitles are very, very visible. Yeah. Uh, you kind of take a picture, see yeah. the subtitle, and it makes a mem, yeah. uh, and everybody is like laughing, or, yeah. or not it circulates all over the social networks. That's pretty easy to, to, to do these days, yes, and reach you know, every corner of the world. Um, personally, I'm not one to uh, censor translation and, and or to manipulate the original text. I think if somebody has decided to use in their dialogue a particular term, a particular expression, a particular reference, uh, be it to uh, uh, the sex area or uh, from a perspective of racial abuse or sexual abuse or whatever it is, if they decided to do it in a, for a particular case and if you are going to be translated that, you might decide, okay, I don't uh, share the information that is being distributed here, hence I won't translate it, this is not the sort of thing that I, I feel comfortable translating, then that's fine and you don't go into that. If you are asked to translate that into your, into your language, or if I am asked to translate into my language, I will try to be as truthful to the original in that field as well. Now I know this is very personal and probably because my background, having brought up in, a, in, in Spain during a dictatorship, uh, produce something else in, in my attitude to this sort of translation. I do understand that in some countries the mere use of this terminology, of these uh, expressions might be very uh, uh, upsetting for certain people and, and they might be shying away from the original and do like all the in Germany, translations. Some of the uh, historical references might be uh, yes, they might be, you know, anything to deal with Hitler or so on. But my, my worry there is that then anything could go, 
you know, you could say, well, okay, this is because uh, it's a reference to Hitler. If somebody has decided to make a reference to Hitler in a Spanish film, uh, why should you change it? And if that is the implication in that Spanish film, I think any German person should be able to know that that was the reference that was made. The South there. Park, for example, is a, a famous cartoon for the yeah, South Park. Totally, totally. Although uh, one of the characters is directly called a kind of a Hitler-like uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Cartman, yes. Yeah. But also, you know, uh, you know, uh, Quentin Tarantino, you wouldn't understand him without all the swearing and all these references, so it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's why I think, you know, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about Netflix, I know, uh, but, you know, all their guidelines, they will have a phrase, usually towards the end, asking translators, subtitlers, to please be truthful to the original and not manipulate any information that has been in the original when they are swearing. So that's their approach and they're trying to make it as close to the original. Now you've got other companies, and I won't mention the name, uh, where they will give you a list of words that you cannot use in your translation. With in effect, talking, having talked to subtitlers and translators in, in for that big company, they, they internalize that sort of uh, information and they will self-censor themselves. You know, as soon as they see certain words, it doesn't come into the vocabulary to translate with those you words. You have to guess, yes? Working with these companies, you have to guess what they self-censor, right? You, okay. you don't guess. If you, if you work for these companies, they will give you a list ah, of the words you that you can use in your target language. Ah, and if you are a freelancer, you guess or they give it. No, even if you are a freelancer, uh, if you're working with children's programs, for instance, uh, they will give you a list of terms ah. that you cannot use in your translation. Whether you are working in-house or whether you are working as a freelancer, they will say, okay, these are the, terminal, the terms that in your language, in your target language, you cannot use in the translation. Yeah, I remember seeing in Amsterdam this uh, last fall, uh, the database called uh, Grey, uh, Grey Data or something like that. It, is, uh, it lists all uh, the offensive language and signals uh, its appearance in subtitles. It's been, it's been uh, patented. You know, there, 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 is, there are several, uh, several programs that will, they will do... Grayscale metadata, yes. Yeah. yes but it's, again, going back to metadata and going back to subtitles, what they do, these programs, is they scan the subtitles that are going to be coming, particularly in broadcasting, and then they will you choose what you do. If you're a parent, you might say, okay, fine, this program contains too many, plus please block the whole program. You might ask the program to just bleep certain terms uh, in the translation, so they will be blipped in there. Uh, so there is a, a degree of, of, of usage there. The program, so they claim, will also understand the semantic context of the term. So if you say bitch, and, and then you're talking about dogs and animals, then the term will be maintained. But if you're using bitch in another context where you don't see many animals around and probably only ladies, then it will be blocked in the translation. So that's been going on for a few years now and, and, and a way of uh, censoring the information that is going there. And what I find really exciting or very uh, telling now is that you get all these new companies doing the opposite, saying, okay, please don't censor anything. Just translate as you want. To to translate and as truthful as you can to the original even with swearing and so on you check the guidelines for Russian uh, in for Netflix the last page that's what they uh, explain as well that in Russian you shouldn't do anything like that now how that annoy certain sensibilities that might not be willing to listen to those terms and so on, that's another issue. And, and I do understand that it's very problematic. And, and, you know, how do you react to that? Uh, we tend to say very often, you know, a written soft piece of soft, a written text that is, contains software is much more aggressive that did you hear it. Uh, the reality is that we haven't done much research on the topic. We haven't sat many people to watch subtitles that have got yes. swearing and see whether they're really shocked and alarmed or whether they say, well, okay, it wasn't that bad after all. What I keep telling to my students is that there are so many new areas of research that are opening up every day in that field that we are hardly catching up. It requires a lot of international cooperation and effort uh, because uh, different languages, different cultures could contribute a lot because we, every country has its own uh, set of problems like uh, 
uh, in Russia we have our own sets of problems with uh, certain areas being highly debatable. Uh -huh. In China they have their own sets of problems and spin uh, sensibilities about censorship. In, in Germany yeah, uh, Japan own the same. They don't like with swearing. their own history in America. They have now all this uh, witch hunt for uh, males, <laughs> all that stuff that is going yeah, on yeah. over there. Yeah, but yeah. Almost every country has its own set of problems. Now to the last practical question: Which uh, subtitling software will you recommend? <laughs> okay, now I'm risking here. Uh, giving sort of marketing uh, mm, for certain companies. Well, well, people will ask but me uh, what program yeah, should sure. we start? Free programs? Well, program? I will tell you uh, where I work and I've been working for many years uh, in many universities and uh, also some of my publications contain this program and is one produced by Screen Systems and it's called WinCaps and the later version is WinCaps Quantum. Uh, now the, the book that I wrote with Aline Remal uh, in 2007 contained uh, a full-blown version of WinCaps, it was multimedia uh, version and now we're working on, a uh, on the next version of the book that is going to contain uh, a copy of WinCaps Quantum. So that's the one that I'm most familiar with, that the one, that's the one that I've that used for, uh, for my teaching uh, and also for uh, some uh, professional things that I have done uh, in the past. So that's the one that I'm familiar with. But there are many others that, you know, uh, And the entrance level? Equal. Subtitle workshop? Yeah. If you want something that is uh, free, uh, I usually go for subtitle workshop, uh, which I find very easy and, and very intuitive in certain areas. So students catch up straight away with what you need to do there. Uh, also, uh, Eggy Soup or Eggy Soup, uh, which is more uh, uh, subtitle workshop was um, produced and created by somebody from Latin America, from Uruguay. So I think probably there is an element there that speaking Spanish myself as well, you feel a bit more comfortable <laughs> with the things there. I'm not sure. Uh, Eggy Soup is more from the East. Um, um, uh, and again, allows you to do many things uh, with the programs and virtually, you know, sometimes professional quality there as well. Uh, you've got subtitle edit, which is another one that is being used pretty frequently now, and, and many people are going for it. And professionally speaking, you've got many others as well. Easy titles, Spot, Fab, are some of the others that are also there. But you know, once we thought that was all done, and and you got your commercial. Um, subtitle, uh, subtitling programs and your freeware. Now, what we're finding now is that we're moving to the cloud. You know, and, and what I'm finding now uh, challenging is to train students in an area which is very, very new. Uh, that we know some companies are doing everything in the cloud. You don't really need to have your uh, piece of software installed in your computer any longer. Um, but again, because it's so sensitive and so new, they're not very willing for everybody to see what they're doing, which you fully understand. Uh, but makes it very difficult if you want to train future subtitlers uh, to be fully conversant with how would you do it in the cloud if you weren't doing with software. And see, that's with challenge. cloud technologies and cloud-based uh, subtitling platforms, I heard some of uh, our practice, practicing subtitlers complain. When you are hooked up to internet, yep. you get blips, 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 blips from you social can. networks and it makes it, some of them say, I disconnect completely, I have my own standalone uh, no matter what. Uh, yep. So subtitle workshop or any other yep. program like Easy Title, and I'm not bothered by any incoming messages. People are skeptical about not being able to so disconnect. Yeah. What do you think about that? Because it's, it's really kind of maybe behavioral thing, but social networks are all too pervasive. When you get they like, are. Ting, ting, yeah. ting. Uh, I'm, I'm not so much against uh, that sort of no, technological uh, environment. Speaking, they're good. Yeah, yeah. And, and the environment, I, I, you know, you can easily uh, disconnect your social media even though you are connected to the internet and then you can just, you know, whatever is blipping, you just get it sound, uh, no sound whatsoever, mute, and, and then that shouldn't be bother you. Uh, and I think the potential is much uh, is, is much more positive 
uh, than all that, for instance, you could use those uh, social networks, those sorts of connections to be in touch with subtitlers in other languages yeah. that you might be familiar with that are also working in the same program as you are. And when you need to produce something that is really fast turnover, that you have to be really quick, and then you've got certain occasions when there is a humorous uh, scene where you have to come up with a joke when you, you, you know, it's late at night, your mind is sort of going out of work here, you could quickly see who, who else is in the cloud working in that particular program. Uh, maybe it's the Portuguese and I can understand a bit of Portuguese, uh, Spanish and Portuguese, so I can see, okay, what, how did you translate this? Or how is in the, the translation? And I can get inspiration. I said, oh, that will also work in Spanish and I will just borrow that and use it in my Spanish translation. So there is a lot of potential that you can then, you know, being a freelancer in your house or in your home or in your little desk is very lonely sometimes. Having the potential of working in this sort of environmental or uh, you know uh, virtual office when you could see every other no. translators working there. I don't, know, I don't know such programs yet so like they are, you know, the, the, the cloud-based systems allow for that. And as a project manager, you will see everybody working in there. Not so much the translators. You know, the translators and cannot see who else. Una, Una gives a lot of uh, freedom to that, but they, they don't envision like you working in different cubicles, like virtual cubicles. Seeing uh, everything will come in time, okay. and I think I, I think that's what is nice for uh, collaboration. We collaborate very closely with Una, and we're doing research with them, and they're very amenable to to listen to the voice of the translators and what is in there that could also be positive for them. And it's not just technology per se when pro might antagonize some of the professionals because they haven't been considered in the process of developing that technology. So I think things are changing slightly in both ways and, and they're quite willing to listen to. That's all. That's all questions I have. Uh, we uh, seem to have discussed, covered a lot of uh, grounds. Yes, we have uh, indeed. And the weather is getting much better and so okay. we have a stroll around St. Petersburg. I that think. will be excellent. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for um, the chat. Yeah, it's been <laughs> lovely talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.